connections? Yeah, it's. I mean, the, the question is, uh, is it's always possible to, uh, to have a smooth connection from finite edge to large edge. I mean, it's always uh, interpretively connected to the connection. Uh, so is this, isn't your question equivalent to asking whether the 1 over n expansion converges? Isn't that equivalent to that? Uh, because, I mean, what you're saying is that uh, in taking the large n limit, maybe there is some non-analyticity. Right, right. Non-smoothness. That's, that, that's one possibility. Yeah, so I, I don't know uh, the general answer. Maybe there is someone else who knows this. Well, a way to think about it would be like any plus 1, you have a dynamical generated public space micro connection to the system. I guess the larger limit is kind of But at least the factor of Yes. Yes, yes, sir. So, so, so that could be... Uh, that's true, but for example, the example that you gave, uh -huh. which is applet dying cycle, there the, the, there actually the dynamical scale has a smooth limit in the large end limit. Okay. Because the dynamical scale is actually the instant on factor to the power 1 over n. So in fact, it's an R. So it actually depends on uh, the toft coupling combination. So when the n goes to infinity limit, oh, the toft coupling, the dynamical scale is still finite. Oh, okay. So... I don't know if there are examples. Uh, okay. So, so that's uh, so that's uh, a kind of very important uh, reason to consider the large end limit because clearly that's like a conceptual simplification because it means that there is some classical quote unquote classical configuration that dominates the space of. Uh, configurations, and then if you are able to identify what that classical configuration is, you can just study the n equals infinity theory by evaluating all observables on that classical configuration. And then you can systematically fluctuate about that classical configuration and compute quantum corrections. By quantum, I now mean 1 over n corrections. Right? So there is a very important reason why large n limits are, uh, are form an organizing principle. So, uh, so, in particular, uh, this uh, large n classicalization implies that if you consider, for example, products of operators, so this is O1 and O2, where O1 and O2 are some general operators in your theory, then because in the strict n goes to infinity limit, the configurations localize onto some if some configuration which is called the master field. Uh, products of these operators actually uh, expectation values of products of operators simply become simply factorized. And then there are corrections to this, right? The corrections to this factorization in the large end limit are basically controlled by powers of 1 over n squared in gauge theories and 1 over n in vector models. So this is what people call large n factorization, but it's simply because in the large n limit, the theory is described by some classical configuration. Okay, so then, uh, uh, so that is one major motivation. Uh, so, in fact, I should mention the word, probably I should mention This thing is what we call, what some people call a master field. So I think the idea is that even if you study large n Yang Mills, large n QCD, there is, or large n Yang Mills, let's stick to large n Yang Mills. So there is some infinity by infinity matrix gauge field which encodes the information about the large n limit of the Yang Mills theory. And then if you take, so that has to of course be done in some fixed gauge. And then once you find this infinity by infinity matrix, uh, you can evaluate all observables on it, all gauge invariant observables on it, and get results. That's the philosophy, right? And realizing that philosophy in practice is extremely hard. So I know that, I get, I know that the, the, an understanding of the master field was achieved for 2D Yang Mills theory. So I think. Uh, examples or more precise formulations of what the master field are exist uh, in matrix models.
exist in 2D animals. I think this is the work of Gross and Taylor and uh, Rajesh Kupakumar. So if anyone is interested, they can probably look at these papers to get some understanding of what the master theory is. Um, but of course, for higher dimensional theory, well, in general, we don't know what is the master theory. It exists in some real. Okay, so uh, the other thing that we know, of course, about uh, the large N uh, expansion, which is a more technical point, uh, which I assume everybody knows in this audience, and if not, I will just uh, summarize this, is that uh, the large N expansion at least of gauge theories, uh, they permit a proof expansion, which means that if one chooses to look at the Feynman diagrams of uh, this theory, for example, if you look at the Feynman diagrams that contribute to the log of the partition function, which means the free energy effectively, so these graphs are basically computed, these contributions and perturbation series are contributed by bubble graphs. So if you think about Yang-Mills theory, then this is the kind of graphs that contribute. And uh, as is customary, I draw only a kind of sampling of graphs. And I'm not drawing them very well, but I hope convey the point. So the point is, of course, that there is an infinite set of graphs that that contributes to the, uh, to the free energy in the perturbative expansion. And the key point is that there are, there are a set of graphs, uh, like these three here, which uh, are planar graphs. And then there are a set of graphs here, which are drawn rather badly, but these two lines don't intersect. And these are non-planar graphs. So there are two kinds of graphs, roughly speaking, planar graphs and non-planar graphs. And Toft pointed out in his uh, seminal paper that you can actually take these graphs, which these wavy lines are gluons, and since gluons are basically adjoint value matrices, they carry both a color and an anti-color index. And so you can use that idea to replace these graphs by ribbon graphs, which basically means you fatten these graphs and uh, you replace each of these lines by a double line. Um, and where you have opposite flow of color index in each of these, each of these lines. And then uh, this kind of diagrammatic expansion in this ribbon graph language begins to look like that. And then here is sample non-planar graphs. So, there, so you get an organization of graphs into planar and non-planar graphs. So these are planar and these are this one in particular is non-planar. And then there is a map between the set of planar graphs and the set of non-planar graphs. Uh, into uh, certain Riemann surfaces of some fixed genus. So all planar graphs, if you think about it, you can actually draw them on the sphere, uh, whereas a non-planar graph of this kind, it takes a little bit of time, but you can then think about it and understand that you can draw this actually on a genus 1 Riemann surface, that is a torus. And similarly, there are graphs that you can only draw on a genus 2 Riemann surface, which means a torus with two holes. So you can classify uh, the graphs according to your genus expansion and then there is a further important fact that in order to make this all consistent, in order to make the perturbation series consistent, you have to take the n goes to infinity limit n, so 
So n goes to infinity with g squared Yang Mills times n equals lambda fixed. So this is what we refer to as the Tuft limit. And so in this limit, these, this graph, for example, just grows like n squared. And the n counting just follows from the following, uh, uh, the following picture that every time you encounter a closed color loop, you get a factor of n. And every time you get vertices, you, uh, you include a factor of g n minutes. Okay? So uh, every time you have a color loop, you get a factor of n. And every time you have these this vertex as a g yang mills, but then you have to use some factors of n and soak them up into uh, along with powers of the coupling constant in order to get a certain number of powers of the Tuft coupling. So you can go through the exercise and you can then convince yourself that this graph is actually of order n squared times one power of the Tuft coupling. This graph is n squared times two powers of the Tuft coupling. And then this graph actually has no powers of n, if I'm correct. And it has, uh, it has two powers of the Tuft coupling. It's an order lambda squared graph, but n to the 0. So um, the bottom line is that any observable so all observable, so this is equivalent to what is called the genus expansion. And all observables, for example, the free energy or the partition function, can be expanded in a power series, uh, which is a double expansion. So it involves these coefficients, which are functions of the Tuft coupling lambda. And then it's actually a power series in 1 over n. Okay, so any observable can be expanded in this ex in this kind of expansion. The g equals zero contribution, which is the genus zero contribution, scales like n squared, and it's multiplied by some coefficient with some power series and lambda. And so the genus zero contribution are the planar graphs, those guys. And then when you go to the genus one, the graphs that can be drawn on a torus, uh, you see that they actually scale like n to the 0, so they're down by 1 power of n squared compared to the genus, genus 0 graph. Genus 1 graphs are down by 1 power of n squared. Genus 2 are down by 2 powers of 1 power of n squared. So on and so forth. So the key observation that Tuf made apart from this is that this expansion as, uh, as a genus expansion uh, is extremely reminiscent of a string genus expansion or a closed String perturbative expansion. So this is reminiscent of a closed string perturbation expansion where you identify the string coupling G string with 1 over n squared. So here you identify G string with 1 over n squared. So if you identify a string coupling constant with 1 over n squared, this expansion looks very much like a closed string perturbation expansion. And so uh, there was this observation, therefore, that large end limits of yang mills theories should somehow be related to some underlying string theory. Okay. So these are the two uh, uh, kind of general background facts. One, that the large end expansion uh, leads to classicalization. And the existence, possible existence of a master field, and the fact that the large end expansion also seems to suggest that all observables are computed possibly by some underlying string theory. So if you took, take these two facts together, then, uh, uh, then you want to start looking for the master field, and you also sort of expect that whatever this master field is may be related to some string theory, but you don't know. So, People searched for this for decades, and then it fell into uh, people's laps when Maldacena made his famous conjecture. So that is ADS-CFT. So ADS-CFT correspondence provides an unexpected kind of answer to this, uh, 
this question within the context of certain class of large and gauge theories. So, right, and uh, so what ADS CFT does for us, it's a correspondence or it's a duality that actually provides us with both these ingredients that we expect from a large and gauge theory. The first thing it does is it gives us it gives us a master field for large and gauge theories. So you should put a tick mark there because that's one of its big successes. It's provided uh, a master field or it's provided a classical description for a large end theory, which you expected on some kind of spiritual ground and also on the grounds of various examples that we knew how to study in lower dimensions. Um, the second check is the fact that it gives a dual description of yang Mills theory in terms of a weakly coupled string theory. Okay, so, uh, and there's a very important qualification here that uh, this does not mean that every yang Mills theory that we know, or any gauge theory that we can write down, we can write down a string dual for it. So, it provides a deep dual weakly coupled string theory description, and both these things need to be qualified with the fact that as far as we know, right, we can, we can only engineer certain classes of theories. For certain classes, Theory. So, if somebody asks, what's the string dual for QCD, I don't think anybody knows the answer. And it, would be, uh, uh, it wouldn't be correct to suggest that we know how to get that. Uh, excuse me, how to calculate the, the, uh, the coefficient CG? Yeah, so uh, the, these coefficients, they have to be computed in perturbation. So, the way I presented them, right, you just compute them in perturbation series. In the perturbation, you can diagram by diagram. This is a, so the observable I was talking about is the free energy. I didn't actually do a calculation. But if you calculate the bubble graphs, then each of those, you see, each of these, you have an infinite number of planar graphs. And each of those, uh, so this one has no powers of the gauge coupling. So it, ha it has no powers of G angles because there's no vertices, vertices here. So there's no proof coupling. This one has two powers of G angles. So when you do the end counting properly, you will see that this is proportional to one power of the truth coupling, lambda. But then it will come with some number in front of it that you have to calculate, and so on and so forth for all for all for all the graphs. So we don't know what CG of lambda is in general. It's something that you compute. But in this larger limit, it's a double expansion for each order. So you're taking n to infinity first, keeping lambda fixed, and then you have a choice. But well, actually, you don't have a choice. But you may choose to work in a perturbative regime and try to compute CG of lambda perturbatively in lambda. Oh, okay, so uh, it's uh, uh, always you have to fix what the, the order of lambda you want. I mean, ah, yes, but of course, if you know how to solve the theory, uh, then you get CG of lambda as a full function. If you did know how to solve it, so Comades is already. Uh, Proved or not? Uh, I don't know if it's proven, but I okay. My understanding is uh, is that there's very strong case that that the Tuft expansion it cuts down because of this fact that you have this reorganization of graphs into into, into a genus expansion. Uh, so if you take the strict n goes to infinity limit, you get only the planar graphs. That's a drastic reduction in the number of Feynman diagrams. So if you didn't do the large n limit then each order in ordinary perturbation theory, the number of Feynman diagrams goes factorially large, I think. Grows factorially. So that's what renders usual perturbation expansion only an asymptotic expansion, not a good expansion. So this actually makes that much better, the large end limit. It cuts down a huge number of graphs. I don't know if it's generally, I don't think it's proven that this is, the large end limit will yield a convergent expansion. But there are examples in lower dimensions, matrix models, where you can show this. I don't know. Does anybody know better? 
I, I don't think there is a, as far as I know, I don't think there's a proof that it converts. Uh, it actually, it probably does convert for n equals 4 supersymmetric diagonals. I think, Alan, uh, so the integrability story actually uh, has found an interpolating function, right? For That's right, for two point function. For two point function. So there's some observables for which you get an interpolating function of the details from. Are there any other questions? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, am I going very slow? Should I go faster? Okay. That's fine. Uh, all right. So, so, so there are only certain kinds of the, the large end theories that can be engineered using the ADS safety correspondence or string theory. So, what kinds of large end theories? Have string rules. String rules. So, uh, generally speaking, and I don't want to get get into a lecture on deep brains and stuff. But generally speaking, all the examples that we know where these uh, string duals or ADS duals of larger theories can be engineered are generally theory theories realized on the world volume of D brains in string theory. And I should probably also include, but I'm not because this, I don't want to get in, probably M2 brains in, in M theory. Uh, but so the general idea, of course, is that there are these objects called DT brains in string theories, and these are extended objects. So if you have, uh, if you consider n coincident DP rings in one of your favorite string theories, then uh, the low energy fluctuations of these DP rings are basically described by the collective excitations of these DP rings 